The realities of business compliance can be overwhelming. Getting to a solid understanding of all applicable laws and rules is a detailed, complex, and onerous process. First, identifying and gaining an awareness of the portfolio of federal, state, and local requirements that are relevant to a given business can be a monumental undertaking. Which laws, regulations, ordinances, administrative rules, and other published guidance apply to a company's unique offering of products and services? Second, cataloging those requirements in a concise and methodical manner requires an investment of business resources that might otherwise be engaged in profit-generating activities. There may also be internally imposed, voluntary standards for which a company chooses to comply to reinforce its own brand image. Finally, all these requirements, whether legally required or voluntarily adopted, create obligations to comply with them that must be effectively monitored. This is especially true if the company brands or markets its adherence to higher standards. Legal analysis is only the first step. A business needs to know what and where it applies in its operations. The most critical role of corporate compliance is to make sure employees and others who may represent the company know the rules beforehand and that they continuously follow them. All this information, process, structure, and leadership must be implemented in an effective compliance program. After determining its compliance obligations, companies must make further investments in experienced compliance professionals to lead and provide guidance to others in the organization. Ideally, a corporate compliance function should be assigned to a person that reports to the board or other senior level in the company and can be assigned overall responsibility and governance of the program. However, the subject matter experts for a given regulatory policy or standard are typically delegated to the day-to-day -day people who are in charge of operational responsibilities in the company. This may take many forms, but must include the design of easy to understand policies and procedures. In addition, employees may require additional readily accessible guidance to aid them in their compliance roles, such as job guides, posters, or other visual aids. Role-based training that tells an employee what he or she needs to know is also critical. An effective compliance program ensures that an appropriate level of knowledge is spread to those who need to know. Compliance leadership is not simply knowing the law so that the business doesn't get into trouble. It's a successful blending of compliance with an ethical culture. Of course, following laws, regulations, local ordinances, agency guidance, and internally imposed obligations or standards is a threshold requirement. But developing and maintaining a culture based on values, integrity, and accountabilities creates state-of-the-art compliance. This kind of culture goes beyond the minimum requirements to adopt internally imposed policies and obligations based on industry standards and other leading practices. In other words, doing the right thing in a proactive and preventative manner eliminates or at least lessens opportunities for business harm from failures of compliance. Business harms can certainly result when monetary fines or penalties are imposed, but perhaps more importantly, such failures can also damage a company's reputation, not to mention the operational impediments created when you need to reactively remediate a failure in an urgent and often prescriptive manner. As former U.S. Attorney General Paul McNulty said, if you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. Indeed, the most visible hallmark of an ethical culture is exhibited by a company's senior leaders. State-of-the-art compliance requires an ongoing commitment from the highest levels of leadership to consistently demand ethical conduct, in addition to promoting compliance with the law and leading practices. Such leadership does not merely use compliance as an excuse or scapegoat for negligence or wrongdoing. Rather, it supports funding for program resources, supports the hiring and promoting of skilled compliance professionals, and insisting on compliance-knowledgeable subject matter experts to direct and manage their operations. Giving shareholders, employees, vendors, and the public the false belief that the company supports full compliance with the law is more dangerous than no compliance program at all. A company must invest the time, effort, and resources to carefully tailor and individualize its compliance program, not just give lip service to it. Commonly called tone at the top, words and actions of the senior most leaders must be unambiguous, 
with clear and open endorsement for the compliance program and for including integrity in business conduct. Tone in the middle, or the words and actions of mid-level leaders, must be appropriately sanctioned when their behaviors don't encourage ethical conduct or don't support the compliance program. Even more telling, finger pointing, instead of appropriately crafted responses to failures, flags an unwillingness to engage in and commit to a successful program. A state-of-the-art compliance program tries to avoid these things, although of course, unfortunately, even state-of-the-art programs will from time to time experience failures. Clearly defining what compliance means for a particular organization may be necessary, as the company may have stumbled into tribal definitions or different factions prior to the board and other senior leaders committing to investing the time, effort, and resources to build an enterprise-wide comprehensive compliance program. Former U.S. Attorney General McNulty said, Compliance programs are established by corporate management to prevent and detect misconduct in accordance with all applicable criminal and civil laws, regulations, and rules. Further, the U.S. Sentencing Commission Guidelines Manual reinforces that, quote, to have an effective compliance and ethics program, an organization shall promote an organizational culture that encourages ethical conduct and a commitment to compliance with the law. Without appropriate levels of commitment and support from company leadership, a compliance program will fail, or worse, be siloed, inefficient, and cost prohibitive. Let's now turn to building the business case for compliance. Building the business case for compliance and ethics doesn't need to rely on opinion, taking a risk, or jumping in with a leap of faith. Solid business intelligence indicates that an effective compliance and ethics program increases reputational value for a company or brand among consumers, investors, vendors, suppliers, employees, and other stakeholders. In numerous studies, Booz Allen Hamilton, a management consulting firm, found a strong link between a corporation's public commitment to compliance and ethics and its financial performance. Quote, Among financial leaders, public companies that outperform their industry averages, 98% include ethical behavior and integrity in their values statements, compared with 88% for other public companies. In addition, DePaul University reported in its 2004 study that, quote, well-managed companies that take their ethical, social, and environmental responsibilities seriously have stronger long-term financial performance than the remaining companies in the S&P 500 index. Even more telling, LRN, a legal research and consulting firm, conducted a 2006 study that proves new evidence that links a company's ability to foster an ethical corporate culture with an increased ability to attract, retain, and ensure productivity among U.S. employees. Recent studies report that 94% of employees say it's critical that they work for an ethical company, more than one-third reported leaving a job for ethical reasons, one in four workers reported seeing unethical or even illegal behavior where they work, and 89% of those said that it affected them adversely, 97% of recent MBA graduates surveyed said that they were willing to be paid less to work for an organization with a better reputation for corporate social responsibility and ethics. Finally, building an effective compliance program provides an opportunity to take advantage of lessened fines and penalties under the federal sentencing guidelines for organizations that institute effective compliance programs. In other words, if an offense does occur, even though the corporation did have an effective compliance and ethics program, it will reduce the company's culpability, leading to a reduction in fines of up to 60%. The Sentencing Reform Act of 1984 provided for the development of guidelines to further the basic purposes of criminal punishment. The act provided authority to promulgate such guidelines and to prescribe the appropriate sentence for offenders convicted of federal crimes. As a result, the United States Sentencing Commission was created as an independent agency of the judicial branch, with seven voting members and two non-voting members, to establish sentencing policies and practices for federal judges. The original sentencing guidelines were submitted to Congress in 1987 and took effect on November 1st of that year, applying to all offenses on or after that date. The commission was established as a permanent agency to monitor sentencing practices in federal courts 
and to continue research and analysis that may result in submission of amendments to Congress. The Commission may submit to amendments to Congress each year, which automatically take effect unless Congress modifies them. The policy objectives of the guidelines were to create an effective and fair system with honesty in sentencing, reasonable uniformity in sentencing, and proportionality based on the severity of the crime. The resulting sentencing table was based on data provided from pre-guidelines sentencing practices as a starting point. In addition, it provided imprisonment for economic crimes such as tax evasion, fraud and embezzlement, insider trading, antitrust, and money laundering. Criminal regulatory offenses are also addressed in the guidelines, including regulatory schemes promoting public safety. Such offenses may involve food, drugs, and consumer products, as well as environmental crimes. The guidelines authority was influenced, but nonetheless upheld, by the Supreme Court in several landmark cases in 1989, 2005, and 2007. After the corporate scandals surfaced in the new millennium, the Sarbanes Oxley Act of 2002 directed the Commission to develop guidelines and related policy statements that apply to sanctioning an organization. Organization, in this context, means a person other than an individual. It's intended to apply to corporations, partnerships, associations, joint ventures, unions, trusts, pension funds, governments, political subdivisions, nonprofits, and other unincorporated organizations. Now, of course, individuals working for an organization are responsible for their own criminal conduct. But in addition, organizations that are acting through those individuals are vicariously liable for offenses that are committed by their employees or other agents. Modern prosecutions frequently involve individuals and organizational co-defendants. Therefore, the act required that the guidelines be designed so that the sanctions imposed upon organizations and their agents, taken together, provide just punishment, adequate deterrence, and incentives for organizations to maintain internal mechanisms for preventing, detecting, and reporting criminal conduct. The Act further directed the Commission to ensure that the guidelines are sufficient to deter and punish organizational misconduct. Therefore, the requirements set forth to maintain such internal mechanisms are intended to achieve reasonable prevention and detection of conduct for which the organization would be liable. The diligence of an organization in seeking to do so has a direct bearing on the penalties, probation, deferred prosecution, or even declination to prosecute of a company. The Guidelines Manual is clear that when such internal mechanisms or compliance and ethics programs are reasonably designed, implemented, and enforced so that the program is generally effective, then in that case, the failure to prevent or detect the offense does not necessarily disqualify the organization from a lessened sentence or reduction in fines. The fine range for any organization is based on the seriousness of the offense and the culpability of the organization. Culpability will generally be determined by several factors, but the existence of a compliance program will mitigate the ultimate punishment. There are, however, factors that will disqualify a company from the benefits of this mitigation of penalties. First, the company must have in place, at the time of the offense, an effective compliance and ethics program, as specified and described in the Sentencing Guidelines Manual. The manual outlines eight criteria that an organization must satisfy before its program will be considered effective according to the guidelines and therefore eligible for a reduced penalty. In addition, if, after becoming aware of an offense, the organization delays reporting the offense to appropriate governmental authorities, the reductions will not apply. Further, the involvement of some members of the company disqualifies the organization from reductions. Involvement means participated in, condoned, or willfully ignored the offense. Individuals who may disqualify the organization because of their involvement are high-level personnel of the enterprise, high-level personnel of a large business unit within the enterprise, or personnel assigned overall or operational day-to-day -day compliance responsibilities. In some cases, there's a presumption that the organization did not have an effective compliance program when high-level personnel of an organization with 200 or fewer employees or people with substantial authority, even in a larger organization, participated in, condoned, 
or willfully ignored the offense. This presumption, however, can be overcome on a case-by-case -case basis. The good news is that disqualification does not apply if certain criteria are applied by the organization to its upper management regarding reporting obligations. The criteria are summarized as follows. One, direct reporting obligations to the governing authority or an appropriate subgroup, such as the audit committee of the board of directors. Two, detection of an offense before discovery outside the organization. Three, prompt reporting to appropriate governmental authorities. And four, no compliance personnel participated in, condoned, or was willfully ignorant of the offense. If these occur, then the company can be protected, even if its high-level personnel participated in the criminal conduct. The Federal Sentencing Guidelines outlines eight elements required to have an effective compliance and ethics program for purposes of reducing penalties to organizations. The first element regards the appropriate compliance infrastructure within the organization. The organization's governing authority must be knowledgeable about the content and operation of the compliance and ethics program. The governing authority must exercise reasonable oversight with respect to the implementation and effectiveness of the program. In addition to oversight of the governing authority, the senior most level of leadership must ensure that the organization has an effective compliance and ethics program as described in the guidelines. A specific person within the senior most level must be assigned overall responsibility for the program. In most companies, this may be general counsel or the chief compliance officer. Alternatively, many companies may position the compliance function in finance or internal audit, in which case the senior most level, signed overall responsibility for the program, may be the chief financial officer or the chief audit executive. Separately, the guidelines require that somebody within the organization must be delegated with the day-to-day -day operational responsibilities for the compliance and ethics program. Someone with operational responsibilities must report periodically to the senior most level of leadership and to the governing authority on the effectiveness of the compliance and ethics program. To carry out such responsibilities, these people must be given adequate resources, appropriate authority, and direct access to the governing authority or an appropriate subgroup of the governing authority, such as the audit committee. The second of the eight elements requires that the organization must establish standards and procedures to prevent and detect misconduct. This means codes of conduct and internal controls that are reasonably adequate and sufficiently capable of reducing the likelihood of misconduct. Thirdly, an organization shall take reasonable steps to communicate periodically and practically its standards and procedures and other aspects of the compliance and ethics program to the governing authority, leadership, employees, and third-party agents if necessary. It may do so by conducting an effective training program and otherwise disseminating information appropriate to individual roles and their responsibilities. The fourth of the eight elements under the guidelines requires that an organization use reasonable efforts not to delegate substantial authority to any individual whom the organization knows or should know has engaged in illegal activities or other unethical conduct that's inconsistent with an effective compliance and ethics program. Background checks should be carefully tailored to the level and extent of a person's delegation of compliance authority and activities, both upon hire and when being promoted to a position that assumes compliance responsibilities. The manual says, quote, with respect to the hiring or promotion of such individuals, an organization shall consider the relatedness of the individual's illegal activities and other misconduct, in other words, other misconduct inconsistent with effective compliance and ethics program, to the specific responsibilities the individual is anticipated to be assigned, and other factors such as 1. the recency of the individual's illegal activities or other misconduct, and 2. whether the individual has engaged in other such illegal activities and other such misconduct. Exercise of such efforts can also be required for contractors with compliance authority or responsibilities. The fifth element involves incentives. 
the company must enforce appropriate incentives throughout the organization to perform in accordance with the compliance and ethics program. It must install appropriate disciplinary measures for engaging directly in misconduct or for failing to take reasonable steps to prevent or detect misconduct. Adequate discipline of individuals responsible for an offense is a necessary component of enforcement. The form of discipline that will be appropriate, of course, is case specific. The remaining three elements turn their attention from recruiting, hiring, and training of individuals to structures and governing functions that foster and support the compliance and ethics program. The sixth element requires that the organization take reasonable steps to ensure that the standards and procedures prescribed by the compliance and ethics program are followed and are working as intended. There are typically three lines of defense included in monitoring, auditing, and reporting structures. One, self-monitoring by the business. Two, legal and compliance reviews. And three, independent or third-party audits. Regardless of which of these structures are installed, the reporting of all verification activities and follow-up, both to the governing authority and to the leadership within the organization, has to be required. To the extent that internal audit is performing these activities for a publicly traded company, this reporting is actually mandatory and must be provided directly to the audit committee of the board of directors. In addition, an organization has to install and publicize a mechanism that allows for anonymity and confidentiality, whereby an organization's employees and other agents can report or seek guidance regarding potential criminal conduct without fear of retaliation. After the misconduct has been detected, the seventh element requires that the organization take reasonable steps to respond appropriately and to prevent further misconduct, including making any necessary adjustments and modifications to the compliance and ethics program. Leading practice requires investigatory, evaluative, and reporting resources to make certain that further investigations and responses are undertaken following the detection of any possible misconduct. Effective remediation to prevent similar conduct may include modifications to the compliance program, strengthening structures in high-risk areas, or redesigning of program elements. The company should take reasonable steps to remedy any harm that result from misconduct, which may include providing restitution to identified victims. Other steps to respond appropriately may include self-reporting and cooperation with authorities. Prevention of similar misconduct can also include use of an outside professional advisor to ensure adequate assessment and implementation of any modifications. Recurrence of similar misconduct creates doubt regarding whether the organization took reasonable steps to meet the requirements in the first place. In addition, an organization must periodically assess the overall effectiveness of its compliance program. This is independent of the need to evaluate specific areas or elements under investigation for misconduct. Periodic surveys, interviews, and document reviews by independent auditors or consultants are typically deployed to engage the overall effectiveness of the program. Finally, an organization must methodically evaluate the risk that misconduct will occur and take appropriate steps to design, implement or modify each of the other seven elements as identified by the process. To meet the requirements of this amendment, the guidelines manual, in other words, this last requirement, an organization must assess the likelihood that misconduct may occur based on the nature of the company's business. If, because of the nature of the company's business, there's a substantial risk that certain types of misconduct may occur, the company must take reasonable steps to prevent and detect that type of conduct. For example, an organization that, due to the nature of its business, employs sales personnel who have flexibility to set prices shall establish standards and procedures designed to prevent and detect price fixing. Likewise, an organization that, due to its nature, employs sales personnel who have flexibility to represent the material characteristics of a product shall establish standards and procedures designed to prevent and detect fraud. When conducting such a risk assessment, a company may, for example, 1. Examine compliance problems that the company's industry has experienced. 2. Assess a company's own past compliance history. 3. Review documents that may demonstrate the risk of violations. 
such as litigation records, civil complaints, board minutes, SEC disclosures, prior investigations or inspections, insurance records, and auditor's work papers. Four, analyze changes in the company and the industry in which it operates. Five, identify operating practices that inherently may lead to liability-causing conduct. And six, identify non-obvious or incipient misconduct that may promote illegal actions. The primary function of such an assessment is to prioritize and modify compliance resources to focus on conduct identified as most serious and most likely to occur. A company may need to risk rank identified potential for misconduct by scaling the likelihood of its occurrence and the severity of its consequences should it occur. The ranking also provides a mechanism to prioritize or modify the actions taken to meet the requirements set forth in the guidelines manual. Next, let's look at designing compliance program elements. Factors to be considered in determining the action required to meet the requirements of the guidelines include, one, applicable industry practice or standards called for by applicable government regulation, two, the size of the organization, and three, similar misconduct, patterns, and trends. For example, the formality and scope of actions that a company shall take to meet the requirements, including the features of the company's standards and procedures, depend on the size of the organization. A large organization generally will devote more formal operations and greater resources to meet the requirements than is necessary for a smaller organization. However, even a small organization must demonstrate the same degree of commitment to ethical conduct and compliance with the law by relying on existing resources and simpler systems, such as training employees through informal staff meetings or monitoring them with regular walk-arounds. Regardless of the size of an organization, high-level and substantial authority personnel must be knowledgeable about the content and operation of the compliance and ethics program, shall perform their assigned duties consistent with the exercise of due diligence, and shall promote an organizational culture that encourages ethical conduct and a commitment to compliance with the law. To illustrate the design of the program elements, consider the following working illustration of actions required to implement a conflict of interest compliance program. Step one would be compliance infrastructure. This can include, one, identify a subject matter expert to develop and execute the Conflicts of Interest program. Two, identify high-level personnel with overall responsibility and oversight of the Conflicts of Interest program, such as the general counsel, chief compliance officer, or highest level executive in human resources. The second stage would be standards and procedures. This could include, one, draft or review, the conflicts of interest policy, and frequently asked questions on the company bulletin board or internal website. And two, design and execute conflict of interest certification procedures. The third stage could be communication and training. This could include, one, decide which roles within the corporation certify to compliance with this policy, and two, developing training and other communication materials to promote an understanding of the conflicts of interest policy. The third stage is due diligence in delegation. This could include, one, requiring background and reference checks for employees with responsibility for the conflicts of interest program to include screening for illegal activities or other unethical conduct. And two, require background and reference checks for any third parties who may be involved in the administration of the program. The next stage would be monitoring, auditing, and reporting. This could include, one, business units or department heads monitoring employees' listings or exception reports for the completeness of their certifications. Two, legal or compliance personnel reviewing identified conflicts for exceptions or risks. Three, internal audits annually testing for conflicts of interests and testing the process for timeliness completeness and adequacy, and four, establishing protocols for reporting the results of the program to the board of directors and the executive level of leadership, and five, ensuring that hotline reports are routed to compliance for appropriate follow-up. 
The next stage is incentives and discipline. This could be done by one, developing performance goals for individual business units or for department heads for exercising due diligence that prevents and detects apparent conflicts of interests. And two, enforcing appropriate discipline for failure to report or detect an actual or suspected conflict. The next phase would be response and prevention. This could include investigating undisclosed conflicts of interests that were detected in day-to-day -day business dealings, such as, for example, discovering ownership of a supplier by a purchasing agent. Two, preventing similar misconduct by requiring ownership details of key suppliers in the onboarding process. And three, identifying key trends by business unit, geography, or department to evaluate program effectiveness. Four, evaluating promptness in completing the annual certifications. And five, identifying the occurrence and investigation of the undisclosed conflicts of interest. And finally, the last phase would be risk assessment. This could include identifying the likelihood of conflicts of interest given the nature of the business in individual business units or departments, products, services, or geographies, or specific business circumstances that inherently provide the opportunity for misconduct, such as purchasing computer supplies or services, which introduces the risk of selecting a vendor that has a financial relationship with the company's purchasing agent. The second pronged in risk assessment would be to evaluate the seriousness and consequences of the potential conflict of interest. And finally, to prioritize the how, what, where, and when of the compliance activities to prevent, detect, and deter conflicts of interests based on the risks so identified.